Hi everyone and welcome to another video on my channel. My name is James. I'm a coach and biomechanics at the Shenzhen University Sports Center in China. And in today's videos, we're going to discuss about the length of each step during the acceleration of the drive phase. We will also see how can we simply calculate it to maximize our athlete's performance in the short sprints. So stay tuned. Okay guys, here we are. So I hope you're enjoying the intro. I'm not very good at editing videos, so I hope it is actually quite good. So before we start discussing about how to calculate it, we need to talk about why it's important to know exactly or approximately how long each step should be in the drive phase for the 100 meters. So the main reason is because we want to avoid overreaching. The second reason why it's important to control our step range during the drive phase is also to maximize what is horizontal velocity. Whoops, this is too big. Let me change to a line. We need to maximize horizontal velocity and minimize vertical velocity because our goal for our athlete's body is to move forward. We need to express mostly only horizontal velocity and only concentric movements. And the third reason why it's important, it's also because we need to reduce any extra ground time. So we don't need to add any extra time on the ground that's not necessary to complete the push for the athlete's body to, body to move forward. So all these three reasons, one, two, and three, are not separate reasons because they are connected between one and each other. Overreaching will eventually cause your body to improve, to increase vertical velocity, and as well will cause what we call negative energy or eccentric absorption energy, which will increase your contact times on the ground. Okay, so over here, we have an example with one of the athletes I had the pleasure to work with in the last years. So this athlete had the problem to overreach on his second and on his third step during the dry phase, and we can notice it over here. So with overreaching, we mean when the body's or the athlete's foot is striking, you can see over here, and the strike is happening in front of the center of mass, just here. You can see how the foot contact is in front of its center of mass, just right here. Okay, and now, in this situation, mainly two things will happen. The first thing is that the athlete will not be able to push into this next step, so in this case, step number two, until the center mass that it's behind the strike will be in front. So we can see over here, quick example, how the athlete is not able to push until the center mass is shifting forward in front of the foot on the ground. Another thing that will occur if we are striking in front of the center mass, so over here, and the center mass is behind, it's now that because the athlete needs to spend also more time on the ground and the direction is going to be much more vertical, the athlete needs to contrast another force generated on his body, which is gravity, so the force of gravity. So because of this situation, now the athlete, in a, to be able to escape not only the horizontal velocity, but also the vertical velocity, will need to exert a much higher vertical velocity just to escape the effect of gravity rather than being able to escape it by using only horizontal velocity. And now because in this situation, as the athlete needs to escape gravity to be able to move forward, you can see how his body is raising already because he is generating a much higher vertical force direction than what we need or what he needs. So his body is racing fairly quickly and he's not able to generate horizontal velocity. You can see on step number three, already over here, he's still overreaching slightly from the angle we cannot see it very well. But one thing that we can see is that his body is already facing almost vertically. The shin angle is almost vertical. In this situation, on step number three of the drive, we still want our shins to be pointed forward as well and parallel with our torso and we want to have our strike still behind or under our center of mass. If we go back to step number two, we can see another 
problem that is caused by this overreaching situation. And we can see it just over here, if I zoom in, inside this step. So one thing that we can see over here is because of the much higher vertical force produced by the athlete, he will also need a much higher vertical force production in the opposite direction to contrast what is happening over here, which is a collapse of the joints. You can see over here how the joints are collapsing under the weight of the body, which is not only the weight of the body, but it's some weight multiplied by the force, vertical force generated. So you can see how the body is actually absorbing now eccentric energy and before being able to push it, he needs to absorb a lot of energy and then just afterwards being able to push it outwards. So this situation will eventually increase what is going to be the contact times on the ground. Thus are going to make your movement, total movement, total time much slower than needed. Because during the dry phase, during the acceleration, we entirely rely on concentric movements. So we need to eliminate whatever that we don't need. In this case, we don't need to exert any eccentric movement, especially during the dry phase. So one thing that I do with my athletes to counteract or try to fix this problem that many, many sprinters have, you might not notice it, but many of them have it, it's I mark the ground with tape over here. You can see the markers over here. After calculating through the greater to canter leg length, so the length of the leg from the ground to the greater to canter, I will calculate how long should their step be. And this means that through this calculation, I can calculate where their central mass or their greater to canter will be after the first step and after the second step. You can see over here, you can see the marker on the ground. The athlete is still slightly overreaching a little bit over here, but this marker over here is just gonna give me exactly where more or less the center mass is gonna be during the touchdown phase over here. Over here we have another example with another athlete. You can see how the marks are on the ground for step number one over here and step number two over here. Now the athlete has been instructed and he has been working with these settings for a long time. And you can see now he's exiting. So he's performing the execution from a blocks and he's striking very hard to the ground towards, you can see how the strike is towards this direction, so towards the back and the direction of velocity is towards the front. So this is the perfect angle that we're looking. Another thing, I will change the color of the marker. You can see how here, now the strike exactly on point, it's behind the center of mass. So in this situation, now the athlete is in the perfect state, in the per perfect position to maximize horizontal velocity and minimize vertical velocity. Now, I bet that everyone of you is questioning or asking, how do we calculate the strides to make sure that the stride length for your athlete is going to be precise? So these are the steps. Step number one is we need to calculate the GT length or the greater to canter length of our athlete's leg, starting from the GT point to the floor, to the ground, following a parallel line towards the lead, not a perpendicular line towards the ground. Step number two instead, we're gonna use the GT that we just measured and we're gonna calculate the steps one by one. I'm gonna show you how to do this in a second. Well then step number three, probably the longest part of this setting is gonna be marking the ground. Because generally step number one and step number two take a couple of minutes while marking the ground might take a longer time. The first thing that we want to do is to measure the length of the leg, starting from the GT, so the greater to canter. We're going to ask the athlete to stay on the wall, back on the wall like in this video, perform an adduction-abduction movement of the leg that we want to measure, and we're going to easily find the spot where the greater to canter is. After that, we can simply measure from the GT point to the ground. In this video, the shoes are on, but technically you should do this without shoes. So take your shoes off before you measure and make sure that you're following a parallel line compared to the leg and do not follow a perpendicular line to the floor. So once we have calculated and measured the GT of our, of our athlete, let's assume that our athlete is having a GT of over here, 0.92 meters, so 92 centimeters. So let's go on. On stride number one, so the stride that will happen from the exit of the blocks, we will need to calculate the GT 
times and multiply it times 1.5. So an example over here is going to be 0 0.92 times 1.5 and a stride length of 138. So this means that the first stride from the rear plate of the block, we're going to show you later in the, lead, in the video, from the rear plate of the block towards the first contact of step number one, we're going to need to mark the tape at 1 meter and 38. For step number two instead, we're going to still use the GT length over here and multiply it by 1.25. So in this case, 0 0.92 times 125 equals to 115. This means that step number two, so in between strike of step one and strike of step two, we need to separate and put the markers at 1 meter and 15 between each other. From step number three, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to add 10% of stride number two. So in this case, 10% of 115, which in this case we're going to assume is going to be around 11 centimeters. And we're going to add and keep adding 11 centimeters to each step. So step number three, step number four, step number five, and step number six until our drive phase and acceleration is complete. And if you use the same fictional GT length of an fictional athlete of 0 0.92 over here, then we can table all the strides that we need to perform for our athlete over here in this situation. So step number one is going to be 138, step number two, 15, 26, 37. So this is this distance between each step. Well, this is going to be the distance over here from market from the beginning of the movement, or so from the rear plate of the block. Usually what we want to do is we want to mark our steps between around step seven and step nine. I will not recommend to go above step nine because this is where we're going to enter the transition phase. So our athlete's body is going to be racing, going more in a vertical state and entering the max velocity stage. And once we have our calculations done, then we can mark with tape or anything that you have available over here on the track. And how do we calculate that? It's quite simple and straightforward. So we're going to calculate the first step. So in this case was 1.38. We're going to start from the rear plate of the block just over here and calculate over here 1 meter 38. So this is going to be the distance of step number one. Then from here, we can calculate the second step. So from step one to step two. And if I remember correctly, it was one meter and 15. And we can continue this, so on, so on, and so on. Okay, and now after calculating and marking the ground, you as a coach and your athletes have those marks as reference to help your athletes to understand where they should strike the ground. And this will help them to maximize horizontal force production and horizontal velocities. Okay guys, that's the end of the video. I hope this video has been very helpful for you if you're a coach or an athlete. If you'd like to subscribe, please do so. This will help us to do more videos for the future. Until next time, thank you.